now that I'm all out of breath. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Our scripture is taken this morning from Luke chapter 20, verses 41 through 47. And he said unto them, <clears throat> How say they that Christ is David's son? And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore calls him Lord. How is he then his son? Then in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and highest seats in the synagogue and the chief rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers. The same shall receive the greater damnation. I think we're a little bit jazzed right now, Lord, because we've had a great testimony. We've had some great singing. We've enjoyed your presence. We've had the privilege of glorifying you. And as we've read your word, Lord, and as we uh, prepare to hear what it means to us, we ask you to speak to us. We ask you to give us the, the character and the awareness of you that will allow us to live a life that gives you glory. And as we give our tithes and offerings today, we ask you, Father, to receive the glory for that as well. A, a thank you for the prosperity that you've given us and meeting our needs in our life, that we might live a life that gives glory to Jesus Christ. We pray that all that is given to this church will be used for the expansion of your kingdom and that others may know that you are worthy of our service, and we might learn how to give that service in a way that honors you. And I ask for all of it in Jesus' name. Amen.
I've asked the guys in the back to present pictures of, of the churches in our community. Most of them are Mennonite churches, the pictures you will see. But you know a church doesn't just happen. It takes the love of the people to get together to build it. My, wouldn't you love to sit on some of those building committee meetings that build the churches? But oh my, to build it, to be together, a place we can come to worship, to be together, to help each other in our needs. And oh my, each one of us have situations that we need prayer for. And to be able to help each other, to be able to call each other and to get together to worship and in a free country. So thank you for the people that built this church too. And this church was built by the people. And a lot of these churches you're going to be seeing on these, these, these pictures have been built by the people. Not big some construction crew that came in to build it. But it's such a blessing to be able to come together to worship. So you'll be seeing these pictures of these churches. Most, I guess, are in the western part of Oklahoma. And these are the Mennonite churches.
children that take their kids to school. Back to my point of speaking and being here today. One, one through six, new international version. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, and whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water and who yields its fruit in season, who leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stay in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. I can't either. That was awesome. Hey, at this point, we, will, uh, we have an opportunity for the kids to go and have a, a lesson that is designed for their age group. We call it uh, youth church or children's church. Uh, and the parents, if they want to take advantage of that, you can have your kids go on back to that, that uh, group. Cynthia is gonna, apparently going to be facilitating that today because she's leading the group out like the Pied Piper. And, and I just love to see those kids go back there. Uh, that also frees me up to say a few things. Now, I don't have to, but I might end up being inspired to say a few things that uh, are more appropriate for more mature ears to hear. Uh, since I don't always decide exactly what I'm going to say ahead of time, I kind of play off the crowd a little bit. Uh, I need a little extra help from God sometimes to make sure that everything gets said right. And I appreciate it if you would uh, help me ask the Lord to say the right things this morning. So please, let's pray. Father, we're excited about hearing from your word. We're thankful for its availability. Um, I'm excited about just hearing it recited. What a wonderful presentation. We offer that to you for your glory as well. We ask you to glorify yourself also in speaking to each one of us to hear what we need to hear to be encouraged to live the life of Christ in the way Christ wants it to be lived. As we look into your word, we ask you to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've lost track of how many weeks we've been in this series called Success to Failure in Seven Days. This is either the fifth or the sixth week, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, we're looking at that last week of Jesus' life in Jerusalem where he, he came in on Sunday on the donkey to the cheers of the crowds, just looked like he had uh, the greatest success in the world, and in less than seven days, he's going to be hanging on a cross, the ultimate symbol of failure in their culture. Today, I'm calling the message accolades, and what I want to talk about is the time that Jesus did not accept an offer to join the popular crowd. Now, it's going to be out of the passage that was read for us just a little bit ago, so I won't read it again, but uh, I, I will kind of rehash the story for you in just a second. But before we get into that, when we talk about popularity, I have to admit that I am probably never going to win a popularity contest for several reasons. The, the first reason that, that nags at me the most is, be, is the need for popular people to be able to recall people's names. And I am just absolutely terrible at learning people's names. Uh, I, people I know well, sometimes I draw a blank on what their name is. That does not uh, add points to your popularity contest. But ultimately, I really don't see the gain in putting out the effort that it takes to be one of the popular people, the one that everybody wants to hang around with. I just don't, I don't want to put in the effort that that takes. I'm sure you've seen it as well as I have, the, the effort that people will put into trying to be part of the A crowd, part, trying to be part of the popular crowd. And it leads to challenges that they have to face, the, 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 the temptation to be inconsistent. You know, today I'm with group A, so I have group A's opinion, but tomorrow I'm going to be with group B, and, and it's tempting to have their opinion that day because I want to fit in, I want to be popular with everybody. Or the tendency to be a flatterer. 
you know, you're great. You're wonderful. I love it when you're around. You say everything just right. The next day, flatter the next person. In order to be accepted, in order to be seen as popular, there's also the temptation to gossip. You know, the one day I'm with group A again, and so they're talking about group B, and I ju just jump right in and encourage and enforce all those negative things that they're saying. But the next day, I might go over to the other group and, and do the same thing about the first group. And just, just that tendency to say things that I wouldn't say to their face so that I can fit in with the people that I'm with that day. I've also noticed that occasionally a person who wants to be popular becomes a know-it-all. They feel like they have to have something to say on every topic. They feel like they have to have an opinion to give, and, and eventually they get to the point where they have to correct other people's opinion and to be seen as somebody who's intelligent and, and significant and wise. They're all about presenting a particular image of acceptability. Jesus was tempted to that. Did you notice last week at the end of the message, Jesus had been talking to the Sadducees about the resurrection and he had been able to present a, uh, some evidence and an argument that even Moses believed that there would be a resurrection. This is something the Sadducees had said wasn't there. And when he was done talking to them, one of the scribes said to him, teacher, you have spoken well. And then it's almost like he caught himself where he knew what he had said, and he kind of backed off. But the, the phrase, you have spoken well, is an offer. It, it's an acknowledgment of the wisdom and the correctness of what was said. But it was also a statement that that's what we've been saying all along, because the scribes did believe there would be a resurrection. And they'd had a long-standing argument with the Sadducees. And finally, Jesus had presented the right argument. Not only a good argument against the false teaching, but he had also presented the argument that the, the scribes liked. And they're saying, you would fit in great with us. Why don't you come and be part of our group? Because we would get along so well. It's interesting when you pay attention to the small words in Scripture. The first thing Luke says is, but. It's a con conjunction where he's going to contrast what they've just said. The fact that we're smart, we understand the Scripture properly, you ought to join our group, you'd fit in so well. But Jesus said to them, how can they, and I have no idea who they is, well, you know, there's always a they somewhere, but he says, how do they say that Christ is the son of David? When David himself says, my Lord, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. There is so much in that one verse. It's actually a quote from Psalm 110, verse 1. It's a psalm that's attributed to David. David wrote it. And he starts out with a couple of words that to us are the same word. It says, the Lord said to my Lord. But if you go to the Hebrew of Psalm 110, there's two different words there. And if you're in the know or you want to be in the know, I'll, I'll give you a little trick to understand some parts of Scripture, look for that time when the word LORD is in all caps. Every one of the letters in the word LORD is capitalized. That is an English way of identifying the, the name of God, Yahweh. Sometimes it's pronounced Jehovah. It was the name that God gave for himself when he was talking to Moses at the burning bush and Moses asked, well, if they ask me what your name is, what should I say? He said, well, I am that I am, so I am is my name, and that is the Hebrew word Jehovah. So God said to my Adonai, it's a different Hebrew word, 
I love to talk to the little kids about uh, Adonai or the word Lord because we tell them the word Lord means he's the boss of you. But since we're in a little more mature room, I'll go that next step further where he's not just the boss, but he's the one who has the right to enforce his authority to make what he says happen. He's got a lot of authority, which is the challenge in this verse. Because David is saying, God said to my Lord that he could sit at God's right hand. And every Jew who had ever read this passage recognized right away that this is a prediction of the coming of their Messiah. Or Jesus in this Luke passage says the word Christ. In English, both words mean the chosen one. How can David's children, one of David's offspring, become David's Lord? We don't understand the perplexity of that because in the United States, we dream that our kids will outrank us someday, that they will outdo us, be more successful, be more satisfied, be more at peace than we are. But in the Hebrew culture, when a child was progressed in authority or moved up in, in power, the father did not become underneath that person. He went up above them. The father was always above the son. And would never say, he's my Lord. So how can they say that the Messiah is going to be David's offspring if David said, he's my Lord. He's pointing out to them that they don't even understand the context, or I'm sorry, the content of the Bible. They have just claimed to understand better than the Sadducees and to invite Jesus to be a part of. Not only did they not understand the content of it, they didn't understand the significance of it. And he's basically saying to them, now this is really harsh. He's basically saying to them, you've just invited me to dumb myself down and be part of your group. And then Jesus does something amazing to me. He, well, it's brilliant actually. He turns to his disciples and he says, and I believe intentionally, loud enough for everybody in the, in the temple mount to hear, Beware of the scribes. You have to be careful of them. They're dangerous. Because they love to wear these long flowing robes and look important. And look like they're significant people. And they love to walk through the marketplace and be greeted by other people. You know, like important people, like the in crowd are. They love the best places in the synagogue. You know, to sit up front where the, the speaker has to look them right in the face and they can frown when they disagree and they can smile when they agree. They love the best places at the feasts. The person sitting closest to the host was the most significant person at all of the Jewish feasts. They also love to devour widows' homes. And to say long prayers is a pretense. In other words, to impress other people. And he finishes with what may be the scariest words in the entire book of Luke. They receive the greater condemnation. Jesus didn't pull any punches, did he? Jesus faced the truth the way it really was. And I, what I want to bring this down to and help you to understand today is that exposing these self-important people was the last step in moving Jesus from the success of the triumphant entry to the failure of the cross. And perhaps another important thing to see is he did it on purpose. He knew what he was doing. See, Jesus chose truth over popularity. He was invited to join the in crowd, and he insulted them with the truth. 
And I think that is a characteristic of Jesus Christ that we can emulate. We, we need to focus on the truth as believers in Jesus Christ. We need to strive to be like Him. We need to reflect Him to the world. We need to be careful that we are learning the things that He had to say. The truth that He recorded for us in the Scripture. And we need to be careful to live it. So that we stand out as just a little bit. Now, now if I was dealing with teenagers, I'd say as if we were just a little bit weird. Just a little bit different than we have been. If we do that, if we focus on the truth more than we focus on popularity or fitting in or being part of the in crowd, we're going to get several benefits out of that. First, people will like you for who you, for the right reasons. They'll like you for who you really are instead of the fake that you're putting on just to be popular. They'll like you because you speak the truth to them in love instead of gossip. They'll like you because you humbly correct when their information or their attitude isn't right instead of domineering and making yourself look powerful and important. Not only will other people like you for the right reasons, but you're going to like yourself a lot more. You're going to be able to sleep better at night. I mean, you don't have to, you go to night, to bed at night, and you don't have to worry about, I'm going to be with a different group tomorrow. What did I say today? And what do I be careful not to say tomorrow? And how do I say it? And you relax. You don't have to worry about repeating something that you've heard on the gossip chain in the wrong environment. And you'll like yourself better when you, when you engage with other people. You'll be more comfortable. You'll feel more correct. You'll be yourself. Instead of struggling to be somebody you're not. And perhaps, ultimately, at least I hope we get to that point, you'll please the one that matters the most. Jesus, because Jesus focused on the truth, and he'll look at you, and he'll see you, I see himself in you. But this is a tall order. It's a difficult challenge to live the truth. And so I want to give you just a couple of tips, some things that will help you to live the truth. The first is you're going to have to learn what the truth is. You're going to have to engage with the Scripture. I encourage everybody to, um, on, on some kind of a plan or some kind of a, a method to read the Bible. Personally, I use the Our Daily Bread almost every morning. I read that. But then I have a separate system where I read a certain number of chapters every day that's designed to help me read the entire Bible in a certain period of time. There are all kinds of these you can get. I can help you if you need to find those. But uh, I encourage you to read it systematically in a given period of time and more than once. Because when you read the Bible through one time, you're going to see a lot of things. When you read it through the second time, you're going to see a lot of those same things, but you're going to see things you didn't see the first time. And I believe if I added it up right, I've read the Bible through every year now for 38 years, and I still see things every day that I've never seen before. The Bible is designed to help you grow where you're at at the time. And we're going to have to engage with it if we're going to know the truth and live the truth. That's the second tip. We need to live what we learn. We need to put the truth at a higher level of priority. 
Now, this is where the good pastor gets to step on some toes. Because in the America, we're not good at living the truth. We're a lot better at trying to fit in. At trying to do what the crowd is doing. The popular people are doing. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be honest with you. You may have seen this. I may have even told some of you this before. But one of my greatest challenges is being gracious to people who routinely avoid Sunday morning because there's a soccer game. Now, I understand once in a while... You're, you can't make it to Sunday morning. And sometimes that even may be because the kids or the grandkids have a soccer game. But when people miss six or seven or eight weeks, because, you know, we're part of the soccer league and we have a game every Sunday morning, what is your real priority? Prayer meeting. I told you I was going to step on some toes. Prayer meeting. Now, I don't expect everybody to be at prayer meeting every Wednesday night. And I realize that there are some people who have legitimate things, jobs, um, family challenges, that they can't be there on, a, on anything near a regular basis. But have you ever been to a prayer meeting? See, the Bible says that God works through the prayers of his people. And we saw an example of that this morning where the, this congregation united in prayer and a miracle happened. That's awesome. Don't let that get away. That's truth too. But he'll work in all of our prayers. You know, you could go to a, a cell group. And uh, that's not something that's been... Um, real promoted around here, but there are a couple of times during the week that people get together in their homes for Bible study. And I, my terminology for that is a Bible study cell. And, and we're, gonna st we're working through the fruit of the Spirit on Thursday nights right now. If you, need, if you would like to come to that, we're going to be finishing that this week, uh, talking about self-control. I'm a little bit scared of that one, to be honest with you. But uh, we're going to talk about that. And then next week, we're going to start a Bible survey. That's where we start at Genesis 1-1. And in 12 weeks, we're going to go all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. We're going to see how it all fits together. It's a very quick survey, uh, an overview of everything in the Bible so we can see how it all fits together. And you can come to that, and you will be learning the truth. But in a cell group, there's always a time for prayer for each other. And so if you can't make a Wednesday night prayer meeting, you can make a cell group on Thursday night. Folks, if you're interested in a prayer or cell at a different time, all you have to do is let me know. I won't promise I can do it, but I will promise to work on it for you. Because it's when we're together that we learn not just the facts of the truth, but how to live the truth. And I would encourage you all to be involved in something along those lines. Sunday school is, the great opportunity, is a great opportunity to do just that. To come and be involved in learning and hearing from others how they live it. Not only do we learn and live, but we have to remember to learn and live especially when we're being praised, I think that's one of the weakest points of any human being in, any, in anybody's life. When we're being praised, we're tempted to let our guard down. When we're being praised, we're tempted to want more. And so we'll do what we can do to get more of that praise. And that's where, uh, pray for your pastor. Okay, Because that's where uh, the greatest temptation for some pastors is, is to say the things that will get him praised when he stands on the platform. One of the things that we need to learn from this particular passage and from this entire series is that Jesus' version of success isn't based on popularity. 
Jesus' version of success is based on how we respond to the truth. But we have to have the truth in the right order. You see, for many of us, we can look into the Bible, we can read the Bible, we can glean truth from it, we can even control ourselves and and manipulate our own behavior to the point where we live according to the individual rules and regulations of the Bible. But unless we respond to the greatest truth first, none of it's going to make any difference in the long run. The first truth that we all have to understand is that Jesus went from success to failure for us. I have to remind myself of that. Jesus gave up that praise. Jesus gave up that comfort. Jesus gave up that popularity and went to the cross because he knew I had a debt to pay that I couldn't pay. And Scripture says, if you read the whole Bible, it will tell you that every person ever born on planet Earth has a debt to pay that they can't pay. Jesus went to the cross to purchase a gift for us, the gift of forgiveness. You know, that's a financial term, forgiveness. It's a uh, forgiveness in financial vernacular is um, a declaration that you don't have to pay what you owe. That's what Jesus went to the cross to purchase for us. And now he offers it to us as a gift. All you have to do is trust me. Receive the gift. And now... You can live a life that reflects well on Jesus, that acknowledges the truth of the Scripture, and that prepares you for that day when that debt is called. And we stand before the God that we've all offended. And we can say, but I have the gift. The gift of Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. It's the deepest, most significant, most life-changing, most destiny-altering truth in the world. And if you've never received that gift, I'm going to be around here after the service. I'm going to stay right up here in the front, and if you have questions about that gift, I'm here to answer those. Maybe you have received that gift, but you have some aspect of the truth that follows that that you don't understand, and you would like to ask questions. You can come up too, and I'll answer your questions. In the meantime, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. And I thank you for the the revelation of Jesus Christ through that truth and and the character that he displayed that we have the power through your your word and your truth to reflect as well. The Lord, each one of us knows that there have been times when the character of Christ wasn't what, what was evident in our life. Today we offer you the praise for the gift that you've given us, the forgiveness of our sins, the open relationship with you, and the hope of an eternity that's optimistic. Father, there are possibly some people in this room that have questions about those truths. I ask you to give them the boldness to ask and to get the answers they need so that they can receive that gift and then reflect well on Christ. And we ask you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.